evening. Uh, Lord bless you for that. Appreciate all the good uh, comments that we get from time to time uh, from folks watching all over the country and different countries, uh, over in the UK and Australia and Africa and all time, all time. So praise God for y'all. Hope it is blessed to you uh, tonight. Okay, now let's take our Bible and turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. The book of Leviticus 23. I'm going to ask you to do two things tonight. Uh, I won't be as maybe as fun to listen to as it was this morning. We had a lot. We had cut up and had a great time this morning. But tonight you're going to get uh, what you call uh, meat. Strong meat belongs to them that are full age. And so we'll give you some meat here tonight from the Word of God. Leviticus chapter 23. We'll start there tonight. And I'm going to uh, read several. So I'm going to ask you to do two things. Number one. Keep your Bible in your lap open. Keep it up. Because I'm going to be, we're going back to a bunch of scripture. There's like 40 something verses in this, 44 verses in this chapter. And I'll be referring to a lot of them. Uh, and then I want you to uh, take notes. You write these down in the fly, uh, a piece of paper at the front of your Bible somewhere. So like I, said, I, I was hoping I can get all these seven chairs so that uh, everybody could see, uh, at least uh, about most everybody can see. Tonight, we're going to talk about the Feast of Israel. Uh, if you read your Bible, you know you come through there and you start reading it. The Lord said this feast, and he would call it a holy convocation. You read that word in your Bible? And you read that, and the Lord said, you'll have, have a holy convocation. Now, convocation means a gathering of people. Uh, it'd be like, like a graduation. A lot of our kids, some kids are doing high school this week. And it's like a graduation, a ceremony where a bunch of people come together and it's a, he said a holy convocation. It's a time when everybody gets together and it's holy. That's in, the, in Israel's in the wilderness 40 years and God gave them these seven feasts. Now these are seven annual, they did them every year, feasts that God gave to the Jews, remember that, uh, to keep. And it's sort of like we in type as a church, we have camp meeting every year in October. We have youth rally every year in April. We have a camp every year in July. Those are like uh, types, uh, like holy convocation uh, in a spiritual sense that we do it as a church. Now, I believe some preachers teach us different. And I, I wouldn't argue some of them. Some of them, some of them have some good points. I believe that when God, God made this, uh, these feasts to Israel, that they were only to Israel. Now, they have prophetic implications, and they all point to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at this here tonight. And uh, there was four of these fest, uh, feasts in the spring, and three of them were held in the fall. It's very important that you remember that. Four in the spring, three in the fall. Four of them were fulfilled at the first coming of Christ, and when it stands to reason, the other three would be uh, fulfilled at his second coming. Now, let's, let's talk about this tonight. And Jesus Christ fulfilled these first four uh, feasts to the day that God gave them to him in the Old Testament. Now, let's start tonight uh, in chapter, chapter 20, 23 and look at verse number 4. Um, uh, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which he shall proclaim in their season. Here's the first one. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. So tonight, I'll, I'll start tonight uh, with this one. And it was called, the first feast was called Passover. There's a very good reason for that. And he said that would be on the 14th day of the first month. That would be April. April, May was the beginning of the Jewish calendar uh, of, that, of that month, the beginning of the month. And you know the story. Back there in Exodus chapter number 12, you know that story very, 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 very well. Uh, the typology in this scripture tonight points to the Lord Jesus Christ just as plain as a nose on your face. Here in Exodus chapter 12, you know what God told him to do? He told him, he said, uh, he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get y'all out of Egypt's bondage. 
You've been in bondage for years and years and years and years, 400 years, however how long it was. He said, I'm getting ready to bring you out. I'm getting ready to deliver you out of Egypt's bondage. And he said, here's what I want you to do. God could have done it a thousand different ways. But the Lord said, I want you to get you a lamb. He said, get you a lamb. And he said, you take that lamb and you keep put him up. Give him a tenth day of the month and you keep him up to the fourteenth day of the month. And God said that lamb has to be without blemish and has to be without spot. It can't have a sore on his leg. It can't have a, a, a cut or a scar. Just a perfect lamb. Hallelujah. A perfect lamb. And keep it up till the 14th day. And then you'll read that scripture in Exodus 12. I like what it said. He said, uh, get you a lamb. And then he said on the 14th day, he said, I want you to take the lamb. Amen. I mean, it ain't just any lamb. It is the lamb. Amen. If you, I mean, if you can't see that, boy, you ain't read your New Testament. That's what Jesus was. John the Baptist saw him coming down the hill that day and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So he said, You take the Lamb. And then on down there, guess what he said? He said, Your Lamb. Your Lamb. I'm glad. Jesus is a lamb. I'm glad he's the lamb. But thank God I'm glad he's my lamb. Amen. He's mine personally. Hallelujah. And so the Lord said this. He said, I want you to take that lamb. Kill it on the 14th day. And he said, now, what I'm going to do tonight. He said, I'm going to pass over the land of Egypt. And he said, when I pass over the land of Egypt. He said, I'm going to look for one thing. He said, I want you to take that blood of that lamb and strike the doorpost. He said, I want you to put blood over here on one side of that door. I want you to put blood on the other side of that door. I want you to put blood up there on the, on the, on the lintel. And right down there, they have blood, 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 and blood. They didn't know what they was doing. All they was doing is just, just uh, can you see the Lord in that? Can you see that? You know what that pictured? That pictured on the 14th day of that first month. Passover, Jesus walked into Jerusalem there under the Lamb of God, perfect, slain in God's mind from the foundation of the world. They kept him up all night, and on the 14th day, they crucified him. They put the blood on his both hands. The blood was on his head. The blood was on his feet. And God said, put that blood of that Lamb on the top, on each side. And he said, well, I come over, and when I see the blood, I'll pass. I'll pass over you. I'm glad, hallelujah tonight, y'all. When the Lord looks down tonight, He ain't looking for good people. He ain't looking for bad people. He ain't looking for rich, young, skinny, big, little, uh, 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 black, white, green, purple. He's looking for the blood. And He said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. That's what the first feast. And He said, you know what you do? Uh, you you got to keep that feast. And a feast is in honor of the Passover. And Jesus died on that day. So He's dead. Now, quickly. Look at the very next verse, number two. Verse six, and on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Seven, unto the Lord, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you'll make an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. The seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Now, leaven. We're talking about unleavened bread. When the Bible talks about unleavened bread, what he's talking about? Leaven is um, is what you put in bread when you're making bread that rise. That's what makes it rise. Uh, yeast, like like we would say. And this and leaven bread is what makes it come up. So so if a bread don't have leaven, it's it's flat. It's like hard tack. Y'all ever heard of hard? Anybody ever heard of hard tack? That's what's called bread. It's just it's just flat, and it stays flat, and it stays down. It stays down. That is a picture of the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the day after the Passover. It's talking about our Christian walk. It's an interval between that and leaven in the Bible is a picture of evil. The Bible talks about it being a picture of malice, wickedness. And Jesus talked about leaven as being false doctrine. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. So leaven represented evil or, or false doctrine. In Jesus Christ, there was none of that. There was no evil. There was no guile. He was absolutely perfect. And he stayed down. 
got in the, in the grave. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, the Bible said, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and he's on, or, or I'm sorry, and now is 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it said the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, and that Jesus is sincerity and truth, and that bread saved down. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And so uh, the second feast tonight would be the feast of unleavened bread. So what do we see so far? We see that he, he was put up, he was perfect, he was crucified, and the bread, right after that, he was a pitcher of unleavened bread with no malice. He was absolutely perfect and without spot and without blemish, the bread of life. Now, look at verse number 10, please. Look at verse number 10. We'll see the third feast as we go along here tonight. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you become into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day wherein ye wave the sheep and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. So the third feast tonight is what they call the feast of first fruits. Now, if you went to Israel today, they still celebrate these feasts just exactly like the Bible said. They don't waver one little tiny bit. They have Passover, they have the unleavened bread, and then they celebrate the first fruits. You know what the first fruits was? The first fruits, sometimes called the wave offering, where they, the, the fruit would begin to come up, uh, and the harvest would begin to come up. Barley. And the, and the, the priest would take a, a, a sheaf of barley and bring it out like this, and they'd say, we have the first fruits. The crops are coming in. The, that was a seed that was dead, and it's alive, and bringing forth fruit, and he'd wave it before the Lord. Like that right there. The wave offering. So you know what that's a picture of? The resurrection. That is a picture of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the next day after the Sabbath. The priest took the fruit. That would be the Lord Jesus Christ, our high priest. It was not really observed until they got into the land of Canaan. And honestly, this one is played down a lot in Israel today. I, I, I heard a guy giving a testimony, and he's talking about how that he was... Uh, uh, in, in, in Israel for a long time and he said uh, that when it come to this one they just sign a huh, 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 because it's the implication of the resurrection and they don't believe that Jesus was that died and rose again he's the Messiah but anyway the first fruit now when the Lord came up out of the grave when Jesus come forth out of the grave he came forth victorious over death hell and the grave he said it's the, a grain of wheat, corn, had to fall in the ground and die in order to produce fruit. So when he came up, the Bible said he was the first fruits of them that slept. That's in the New Testament. So the Lord Jesus fulfilled this, this feast here by being the first fruits from the dead. Now, why does it say S? Why don't it just say first fruit and only mean him? Well, you know the story. The priest grabbed that sheep like this, and he took it out there and waved it. He said, we're going to have a big crop this year. The crop's coming in. So when the Lord came up, the Bible says that when he came up, he didn't just come up by himself. He brought a bunch of them with him and went down into Abraham's bosom and cleaned out paradise and brought them people up with him and in a sense just waved them up there and say, Lord, he's the first fruit and look who I brought with me. You know, that had been a wild scene back in them days, people. I mean, the Bible said they came out of the graves after his resurrection. You don't hear that preached much on Easter, but I'm telling you, buddy, they come out of them graves. He went down there. You see, for all those years and years and years and years and years, those Old Testament saints, they died. They didn't go to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom. They went to paradise. You know why they didn't go to heaven? Because they couldn't. 
Their sins hadn't been taken away. Their sins were covered by the blood of bulls and goats, but not taken away. Am I right, preacher? They just covered them. They, those bulls and goats covered them, but it couldn't take them away. So they was down there waiting. You know, I've heard all them preachers, all them preachers preach on that, and I love to hear them give them illustrations. And they say down there, every time somebody die, they look and say, reckon that's him. Somebody going to get us out of here. One of these days they say, we're waiting on him. Reckon that's him. I don't know. I don't know, that's Moses, I come so-and-so, I come so-and-so, I come so-and-so. And then about that time one day, somebody said, uh, well, this is different. Uh, here he comes. And the Lord came out there and the Bible said he led captivity captive and he emptied out paradise and he said, all right, boys, let's go. The price has been paid. The blood has been shed. Uh, it's all over now. Uh, the blood of bulls and goats covered them. But John the Baptist said, there's the one that takes them away. That uh, takes them away. And so he said, I took your sins away. And the Bible said they came out of the grave after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to people. Lord, he mercy. Can you imagine living in Jerusalem and there's already rumors all over the place about Jesus up walking around and then somebody said, Mama, they said Abraham was downtown giving out tracts. Mom said he'd been dead 2,000 years. Are you talking about? No, Mama, he's downtown. Abraham's out there. Jacob, Isaac, Jonah, Habakkuk. All them people out there walking around. I picture, I don't know. I picture all this walking dead and all these movies Hollywood makes. It's just a cheap kind of imitation of what the Bible says. Really has happened or will happen. I imagine they floated about that house of ground. I don't know. Just I, That might not be true. I, that's just the way I think it happened. It might probably wasn't. But anyway, they probably did walk. Uh, but anyway, uh, they could go through doors and all kind of cool stuff. Uh, and just, uh, just like that. And so the Lord said, here they are. And he said he took that first fruit and he waved them and said, hallelujah. And we'll study that in Ephesians next time about how he descended into the lower parts of the earth, preached to the spirits in prison. There's you something to study on before Ephesians next time. And then he brought captivity captive and he moved it paradise up to the third heaven where God is. That is a picture of the first fruit. Christ arose. Christ arose. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Turn it with me if you don't think I'm right. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15. This is New Testament. And he said here in 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 20. I believe it is. All right. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Look in verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And so we see that he rose from the dead. Then there was a seven weeks. The Lord said, let seven Sabbaths go by. Somebody tell me how many days that is. Seven weeks. Forty-nine. Forty-nine. And on that 50th day was the next feast. And of course, you know the name 50. It means P-E-N-T. It's Pentecost. So Pentecost was exactly 50 days after this. That's what the day of Pentecost means. And Pentecost was the next feast, and there was a little interval between there and there where they, where they had a, a feast of weeks and, and things happened, so forth and so on. So the next one, after seven Sabbaths, 49 days, uh, there was the day of Pentecost. Now this is where a lot of Bible preachers and teachers teach that uh, uh, the 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 Feast of Pentecost was fulfilled in the church. I wouldn't argue with them, but I, I tend to want to think they were all for the Jews and only typical for the church. And that's what I think. Uh, but I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't fuss somebody over it. But anyway, the days of Pentecost. Now the Bible said the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1 was fully come. The Holy Ghost came down on the day of Pentecost. That's right. Uh, uh, the Holy Ghost came down on the day of Pentecost, and that leads a lot of Bible teachers to preach that the Lord will come back on the day of Pentecost, the rapture. I don't necessarily think that's right. You can't predict when the rapture is going to be, but there are a lot of people uh, who teach that. But the day of Pentecost was exactly when the Holy Ghost came down, 50 days after that. Maybe he will go up 
at the same day. I, I don't know. Nobody else does either. But that's the day of Pentecost. So that is four. Now all these four were held in the spring. Spring of the year. April, May, and maybe the first part of June. All these were spring feasts. Passover, the death of Jesus. Unleavened bread, his, his pure life that he lived and sacrificed. First fruit, resurrection, Pentecost, the, the, the day when the Holy Spirit came down and they, they lived for the Lord and sacrificed there in, in the wilderness. Pentecost in the New Testament. Now, number five. Notice there is a huge gap between four and five. There's a long gap between the fourth feast and the fifth one. This one was called Feast of Trumpets. We'll show you that here in the scripture. Look in chapter 23 in your Bible now and look at verse number 24. 23, Luke, uh, Leviticus chapter 23. And verse number 24. He said this, speaking to the children of Israel, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month. Now, if it's April, May 1st, June, July, August, September, October, November, somewhere along in there. Uh, let's say, let's say April, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, October, November. Just like we have youth rally in April, October. Count me in October. They had Pentecost in the spring. They had the Feast of Trumpets, plural, in the fall. Now, here, these three, if those four were fulfilled at his first coming, I have no doubt the other three are a picture of his second coming. And here we go. Trumpets. There's an interval between Pentecost and when the trumpets are blown. There's 2,000 years so far uh, uh, that there's an interval. Now, when God deals with the Gentiles, the clock of the prophetic time clock is turned off. One of the most important things you'll learn about studying prophecy of the Bible is God never deals with Jews and Gentiles at the same time, except with exception. See, he's dealing with Jews when he comes first time, but a Gentile can get saved. The Syrophoenician lady was a Gentile, so they can get in. But the main ministry when the Lord came the first time was to Israel. I mean, it's plain as day. He said, he said, I'm not sent, but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then he turned to the Gentiles there in the book of Acts, and now the Jews are blinded. They'd have to be not to be able to see this. They'd have to be. Can you imagine them Jews over in Israel every 14th of April going to put that blood up there on that? Can you imagine? How come they can't see that? The Bible said they're blinded. They're blinded as a nation. They go through all these rituals. They take a cup of wine when they sit down to eat this unleavened bread and they'll take it and set it out on the front porch for Elijah. They will. They still do that today. They say, why do you do that? Because Elijah's coming and we want him to, Lord, he'll be drunk the time he gets here. Uh, 10,000 cups of wine out there uh, waiting on him. But Elijah's supposed to come and get them. And Elijah has come. And Elijah came in the spirit of John the Baptist and they rejected the kingdom. So God put in 2,000 years, age of grace and called it the church and me and you get in. Now, see where we're at here. Big interval in between uh, the, 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 Trump, uh, the day of Pentecost, which happened 2,000 years ago, and the trumpets. Now, this thing about trumpets, this is where it gets, this is where it gets uh, very, very, uh, I mean, give you goosebumps. In the first day of the month, this is the first fall feast, followed by the days of atonement, convocation. The trumpets are for the calling of the assembly. So when the trumpet blows, they that means get everybody together. Let's go. Call the troops. Now, that is a picture of the trumpet me and you will hear at the rapture. As a matter of fact, they call them to the assembly. They call them to journey. The trumpets blow when it's time to, to travel and for the camp. And he said this. He said, they said, tradition said, the Bible don't say this, that they blow them thing, blow 100 trumps on a trumpet. A trump is a sound that a trumpet makes. So Paul wrote, when he said, 
the last trump. That's the sound that a trumpet makes. Now, don't get that confused with the last trumpet in the book of Revelation that's announcing the wrath of God on the world and on the Jewish people. That's a different trumpet. So yeah, that so people want to be on the internet, and I'll get them. I, maybe I can help y'all if you listen to me. They all say, "No, the Lord can't come until that last trumpet blows." It's not that simple, friend. Uh, we're dealing with Israel right now, and those trumpets call them. And you know what he said? He said, "You shall afflict your soul." So this is the time of eat rejoicing. That is the time of sacrifice. When these trumpets come, it's a time of affliction, hard times, trouble, tribulation, Jacob's trouble. The tribulation during those times when the Jews will suffer. You know what they said when he died? They said, his blood be on us and on our children. The Lord said, all right, you're going to get it. And Hitler had six million of them cremated, burned, and incinerated. And they they killed them Jews by the millions ever since then because they rejected their Messiah. And during that time, God's going to deal with them again. Pictured by Joseph and his brothers. Joseph. King over Egypt, sitting at the right hand of, of, the, of the king, feeding his brother. They didn't know him. He was giving them food, and they didn't even realize it was him. It was him that they sold into slavery. It was him. And the Jews still are blinded tonight. They can't see Jesus for who he really is. But that day is coming when the veil will fall, and they'll see him and know who he is. And then the, the trumpet's going to have, that's called uh, Rosh Hashanah. You see that on, on your calendar? And you know the weird thing about that they call it? They call it the day of shouting. Uh, the Lord sent in heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, trump of God. It's a picture, a rapture is pictured by that. You know what he said? They shall dwell in booths seven days. That means they don't really have a home. Uh, booths. During the tribulation, they will flee. During the middle of the tribulation, they will say, uh, woe unto them that are with child. And then they give suck in those days. They're running from the Antichrist. The Antichrist goes in the temple, sits down and says, I am God, worship me. you got to have the chip in your hand or in your forehead. You can't buy anything. You can't sell anything. Flea market, out of business. Old guy down the road here doing business with cash, out of business. Have you noticed they're trying their best to keep us from using cash? That's so every transaction, the government don't want you making no money that they don't get a chunk out of. And that's what that's what they're after. And eventually they're going to get that. And he said, you can't buy or sell. Well, they're going to run to the wilderness. And many believe that it's uh, the Red Rose City Petra there in the, in the, in the Holy Land. I, I don't know. That's what a lot of Bible teachers teach. And they preach. That's the beginning of the fall feast. Jesus observed this feast and the seventh month, the first day, on the Sabbath. The blowing of trumpets and a holy convocation afflict their souls. And tradition said they blew the trumpet a hundred times, and that last trump was called the awakening blast. That's what they call it. All for the Jew, not for the church. Uh, let me help you a little bit with that, you people that are watching online that believe Paul meant the trumpet in Revelation. The book of Revelation wasn't even wrote until 90 A.D. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in about 58, 60 A.D. when he wrote that last trump. There was no seven trump, last trumpet until John wrote Revelation. That's something for you to think about. So there's a big difference there. So in verse 42, they dwell in booths seven days. So we see this. We see, we see Passover, death. Unleavened bread, perfect life. First fruits. Resurrection. Pentecost, Holy Spirit working in the life of the believer. Trumpets, gathering the people together as they will, uh, gathering the Jews together during the great tribulation. The next one, the next one, look at verse 27. Verse 27 is the next feast, and that is called the Feast of the Atonement. Now, when the Lord died on the cross, He made the atonement. It didn't work for the Jews because they rejected it. There will be a time during the great tribulation that he'll be made known to the Jews just like Joseph was made known to his brethren and he'll be revealed to them and the Bible says a nation shall be born in a day. The Feast of Tabernacles. It's at the end of harvest. It lasts seven days. It's a picture 
of, of, of the end of the tribulation where they'll dwell in the land for a thousand years, have peace on earth. And you know that because when Peter was on uh, Mount Transfiguration with Jesus in Matthew 17, uh, Elijah and Moses came down. Elijah and Moses, the prophets. Elijah and Moses, the two witnesses in Revelation 11. I know there'll be people fuss about that. They think it's Enoch and all that kind of stuff. There has to be Moses and Elijah. They're the only two men that fit the description there in Revelation chapter 11. They're the last two men mentioned in the Old Testament. Prophets are the last prophet mentioned was Elijah and, and uh, Moses, uh, the man of God. So uh, uh, when they come, when, when them guys come, there will be, they stood down on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And you know what Peter said? Lord, this is the kingdom. Let us make three tabernacles. Well, after the atonement's made, that's what he said. Lord, let us make three tabernacles. That's the last one. Look at this. He said, the kingdom has come. You remember when Jesus was standing there in chapter 16? And they came around and they said, uh, they said, man, when your kingdom come and everything. He said, I'll tell you right now. He said, there's some, turn me up just a tad, he said, there's some people standing around here right now that's going to see the kingdom of God come. And they said, what? They're going to live to the kingdom of God come? And the next verse, chapter 17, verse 1 said, seven, after six days. What's after six? Seven. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into a mountain to pray. And the Lord appeared uh, there, there with them. His face was shining. That was a picture of the kingdom right there. And Peter said, let us make three tabernacles. He said, the kingdom's come. we got to have a tabernacle to live in. So the tabernacle pictured the Jews living on earth in peace for 1,000 years. And there's what Matthew meant in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those Jewish remnant that, that, that endures the end, the Lord saves them through the tribulation and they come out on the Feast of Tabernacles. They're to build booth. And so he said, let us make three tabernacles pointing to the millennial rest, the Sabbath day, the 1,000 years rest on this earth. So we see Jesus died, Passover. Out of Egypt, unleavened bread. Getting saved, coming out of Egypt. Resurrection, uh, first fruit. Holy Ghost, Pentecost. Uh, trumpet, rapture, second coming, all the gathering of Israel, uh, number five. Atonement, chapter, uh, number six, tribulation, tabernacle, millennium. So when these Jews realize, hey, we done him wrong. We, he really was the Messiah and we didn't know it. And Lord, the Bible said a nation will be born in a day. That was, that was pictured by the Feast of Atonement. And then they have the tabernacle and live forever with the Lord. So you see, thousands of years before he ever came, it was all prophesied right out. And we're strongly believing that he fulfilled these first four at his first coming. He'll get the other three at his second coming. Amen? That's right. All right. Let's stand by our head for prayer. Our Father, Lord, we thank you for these stuff in your word. Lord, we know this. The professors at the University of North Carolina don't even know this. They have no idea. The Jewish rabbis in Jerusalem have no idea. You chose to reveal them to babes and ignorant people and people like us that believe your word. Lord, I'm glad that heaven and earth might pass away, but your word will never. Thank you, Lord. For what we've learned here tonight. Help us, Lord, as we study our Old Testament. And remember what Jesus said. That they are they that testify. Lord, bless us as we study, as we learn. God, I pray that you bless Shining Light Baptist Church. Fill this place with power, people, and praise for the glory of God. Whatever you do, we'll thank you for it. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, on all Sunday school teachers, bus workers, anybody that's interested in those bus licenses, let me know before you go. Uh, also, let me know if you're planning on riding the bus Friday night so we can know which bus we're going to be taking. I need to know that.